Okay, well, he's getting that up. Uh, I'll just say um, I'm not going to be presenting an academic um, presentation. There's only nine slides, so hopefully it'll be good bubble gum and we'll get on to uh, <laughs> Mariska uh, to talk more about um, survivorship of, of the juvenile Salmonids. I will say, though, that I have relationships with all the speakers in this session, and I'm going to be presenting some of the management actions that have um, occurred during the drought. And um, so the uh, work these people have done it has been a tremendous um, inspiration for um, these actions. So let's see. Oop. Okay. So my name is David Hines. I'm a fisheries biologist and water policy specialist with the National Marine Fisheries Service. And I'm going to be talking about uh, some voluntary programs that we've uh, undertaken during this dr drought period to uh, try to protect priority streams for uh, threatened and endangered coho salmon and steelhead. And our story begins before the drought in 2010. In the, uh, all of uh, the examples I'll be providing today are in, in the Russian River. And uh, as far back as 2010, a uh, large wine grape grower uh, partnered up with the Russian River uh, Coho Salmon Captive Broodstock Program and agreed to release water from a 250 acre foot reservoir on their property into Porter Creek, a uh, small tributary to the Russian River, uh, to provide summer and fall rearing uh, habitat for Coho Salmon that then the broodstock uh, folks planted in there. And they've repeated that uh, every year since and expanded it to include some uh, pulse flows to stimulate out migration of, um, of coho with some uh, impressive success. So that was, that's been important as sort of a precedent to these uh, or, or proof of concept to these flow augmentation projects that I'm going to be talking about. We all uh, know, of course, that the, the drought we're entering the fourth year of it here, and uh, the governor declared an, a drought emergency last year. And in response to that, the National Marine Fisheries Service and California Department of Fish and Wildlife uh, developed this voluntary drought initiative policy. It's intended to encourage uh, landowners and water users to uh, conserve water to help protect uh, surface flow and streams for fish. and. Uh, Although the policy was originally ten, intended to encourage water conservation, we recognized fairly early on that it could be used for these flow augmentation projects, and we signed uh, the Porter Creek project as the first uh, VDI in 2014. So now, of course, the drought is continuing into 2015, and the State Water Resources Control Board, which is the agency responsible for regulating water use in the state, uh, adopted emergency regulations uh, for the protection of specific fisheries in four tributaries to the Russian River, uh, including Green Valley Creek, Dutch Bill Creek, Mill, and Mark West Creeks. And these regulations include uh, mandatory water conservation requirements uh, for residents in those areas. And uh, the agencies continued with our voluntary program and have uh, signed this year three additional flow augmentation projects modeled after the Porter Creek project. Two are, were in Green Valley Creek and one in Dutchville Creek, which I will be talking about uh, a little bit more in depth on the next slide. I do want to mention, though, that the voluntary program is not just flow augmentation. There are uh, 41 water conservation and fish rescue agreements signed with the department and that wine grape growers in the Russian River Basin have uh, developed their own independent voluntary program and had a significant amount of acreage sign up with a commitment to reduce uh, water use by 25% over last year's uh, amounts. So we're very uh, excited and proud about the, um, the Dutchville Creek flow augmentation project Dutchville Creek is one of a handful of tributaries in the Russian River that are important to coho salmon, and it is one of the four that are subject to the uh, State Water Board regulations. And as with many streams in the area, um, 
flows were diminishing rapidly and we had about 3,400 juvenile uh, coho salmon and steelhead known to be in that reach uh, or in that stream. And uh, so we approached the Camp Meeker Recreation and Parks District. They're the uh, water purveyor for the nearby town of Camp Meeker and uh, asked them if they would be willing to release some of their water into the creek for fish. They agreed and committed to releasing trouble because I can't see anymore. Um, um, they agree, they committed to releasing uh, water from their supply pipeline uh, until uh, or through November or until rains restore flows naturally. Um, their water comes from two wells uh, down near the mouth of Dutch Bill Creek on the, along the main stem of the Russian River. They take that water and uh, move it up a pipeline uh, that goes um, along Dutch Bill Creek up about five miles to Camp Meeker where they have a uh, water treatment facility and uh, we uh, tapped into that just before they treated it so the raw water a portion of the raw water comes back down into uh, Dutch Bill Creek and of course it took a lot of partners to make that happen To give you a better sense of what impact the project has had, uh, consider that the, the flows in Dutchville Creek were virtually at zero in August, and we had those fish uh, sitting in there waiting to die, essentially. And um, uh, so we were able to initiate flows on the 25th of August at a rate of 45 gallons per minute. And uh, I'll show a, a wet dry map later, but uh, approximately a mile of um, uh, creek downstream uh, has re-wetted and there's a gauge there as well that show um, significant flow increase which I'll show as well and importantly um, pools that were uh, disconnected uh, became uh, reconnected or um, enhanced the connections and uh, that has important ramifications for water quality and the survivorship of these fish. Um, I believe Mariska will get into that a little more detail in it and um, uh, both Cleo and uh, Jason referred to that as well. Uh, we were lucky in this project because the water coming out of the pipeline, the water quality was very good. Temperature and dissolved oxygen were within acceptable limits for the species we're concerned about. This is a hydrograph showing um, flow just below the release site over the last uh, six years and uh, you can see the progressively lower uh, summer base flows as the drought sets in with 2015 in red flows approaching zero in August and um, uh, several days after we initiated the release you can see the response in the stream and then shortly thereafter we had a, a, a rainfall event that caused that spike. And here are a couple of photos of Dustville Creek at the release site before uh, we release the water. Um, actually, when you look at these pictures, it doesn't make, make a big impression, at least in my mind. Uh, it's not like a torrential uh, release there, but it's enough to make a difference in the water quality uh, and sustain the, the habitat for the fish. So uh, Derek from the Department of um, Fish and Wildlife will be talking more about the wet dry mapping uh, surveys they did. I don't want to steal his thunder here, but I did want to just show uh, that prior to the release, the department uh, looked at the extent of wetted stream below the release point. The release point is on the lower right hand corner of the green circle. And you can see uh, where the stream is wet, it goes intermittent and then dry and then uh, after the three weeks after the release uh, portions of the stream were re-wetted and I'll try to toggle back and forth there. Okay so uh, a couple of takeaway points I wanted to mention was that uh, it was re really impressive how 
having just a few individuals who are willing to um, take a chance and make things happen, how, how they can really make a huge difference. And really, it's a relatively small amount of water we're talking about here. Um, releasing it 45 gallons per minute is approximately a tenth of a CFS. They're doing that for three months. That's 18 acre feet. That's a small fraction of what you see uh, stored behind these major reservoirs that uh, many of you know, I'm sure, uh, you know, can hold tens or hundreds of thousands of acre feet of water. Uh, and as excited as we are about these projects, I do want to say that um, they're not a tremendous uh, substitute for comprehensive management. I mean, we're, we're coming in in an emergency situation and trying to save a few fish, but we're not protecting the, the hydrologic processes that support uh, the ecosystem for these animals uh, in the first place. So um, certainly great to have this uh, collaboration and the, this volunteerism, uh, but we do have to um, make sure we're looking at nat uh, preserving natural processes. And the summer flows are sustained by uh, springs and seeps, of course, and uh, those are popular for to be used as water sources in the summer period when water's lacking. And um, there are some, the regulatory and, and policies surrounding use of those sources of water are, um, sort of in flux, I guess, to just make a general reference to it. Uh, that's it for me. And up next is uh, Derek Aikman with the Department of Fish and Wildlife. I believe he's going to talk about wet-dry mapping.